So <clears throat> now we have snowflakes falling on our intro. Uh, <laughs> we probably need to change that. You know, maybe it's uh, maybe we're focusing on the southern hemisphere. Um, but I took a picture of it and I sent it to Aspen. Good uh, evening, good morning, and I guess good beginning of uh, fall and heading into winter if you're in the southern hemisphere. If you're in the northern hemisphere, we're headed out of that. So <clears throat> um, we probably should get wet the weather predictions off of the off of there. Anyway. <laughs> So how are you this morning, Dr. Vega? Really good. So uh, I, I, I think we should just trade that intro for some beach balls and uh, some sun instead of just the winter thingy. There we go. Uh, you know, with uh, your influence on the, on the selection of music, I would think you might be able to, uh, to help organize that. Yeah, or we can have just somebody playing the guitar live in the intro there we go you know james oh, does I... that james actually has a uh i think he has his own instagram channel with guitar i talked That's with true. him about it and he was a little bit bashful so uh, we'll when <laughs> we'll figure something out but anyway no matter where you are in the world thank you good uh for joining us we're going to be talking about a couple of things one is um the long form discussion today is um a little bit about uh, focused on the Medicare population here in the United States. It's talking about the um, what Medicare is likely to agree to in terms of telemedicine over the next couple of years. Uh, I have had an interest in telemedicine for decades. And one of the things that just drove me crazy was it wasn't the doctors. It wasn't the um the groups, the medical groups, it was the patients. Patients just did not seem to be able to wrap their head around the fact that uh, there are certain types of medicine. In fact, most types of medicine, huge portions of what you can do are, are really just education. They're talking with the doc, finding out, asking questions. Um, and that doesn't require a six hour trip to go see the doctor. And it doesn't require knocking your day out. Um, <clears throat> but you know what? Uh, be careful what you ask for. Uh, there was a thing called the, the pandemic resulting in shutdown all across the world. And people have really gotten used to telemedicine just as a uh, part of necessity. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about what telemedicine looks like in terms of uh, Medicare and Medicare Advantage here in the United States. But it also the, the long form content today also has uh, impact for those of us around the world. Uh, we ha I have patients around the world, uh, Asia, um, the Middle East, Europe, um, plenty of folks in the Southern Hemisphere as well, uh, Australia, um, what are those islands near Australia? It's, I, I know it's New Zealand over there, but right. I don't remember the other ones, the smaller yeah. ones. We've got a few a few folks in New Zealand, Brazil. So um, it's and and it's an easy way. It's a great way to improve access, and those folks have taken taken advantage of using telemedicine in order to get uh, world class preventive medicine. So. <clears throat> It's a key topic, whether you've been there or not. And then uh, obviously we'll cover Q&A uh, at, uh, at the end of the show. I will bring out one Q&A. We, we talked about doing some of those earlier uh, in order to maybe be able to get through a little bit more of them and make them make sense in terms of the topics. JMK2921 uh, hit us before the show this morning with an interesting question. He says that Thomas Spring stated there is no high level proof that statins produce any pleiotropic effects. Your thoughts? I am baffled. Here's why I'm, I'm baffled. It's really clear. There are plenty of studies that demonstrate the impact of statins on uh, cardiovascular inflammation. There is plenty of uh, information about cardiovascular inflammation and what it is. In fact, um, 
it's a great time to talk about uh, the course. I have a course. It's, it takes you about an hour, maybe two, depending on how deep you want to go into it, on exactly what cardiovascular inflammation is. It's like inflammation in other areas. You know, you go back to that, uh, that comment from the, the, the pathologist who did the autopsy on Tim Russert when he had his sudden cardiac death. He said the arteries, the inside of his arteries looked like the pimply face of a teenager with a bad case of acne. And those pimples, those were pustules. And that is your immune system attacking stuff. Um, in this case, plaque in the artery wall. And uh, so there's no question about inf cardiovascular inflammation. And there's also little to no question about uh, statins and their impact. Now, some of their, um, some of their impact um, so is not the greatest. For example, we don't use Lipitor. There's, it's also pretty clear that Lipitor, uh, atorvastatin, does not have an impact uh, for females or for folks with diabetes and or prediabetes. And you put those two together, you know, females are half the population. Folks with prediabetes are 80%. So um, atorvastatin has, a, has very limited effect for uh, the pleiotropic mechanisms. Uh, it has it, but uh, very, very unreliable. I'm just, so as you can see, uh, the information, the data is out there. I'm just uh, mystified by Dayspring's comments. If it were somebody other than Dayspring, I wouldn't be nearly so mystified because I hear that all the time. Um, but I have, as we've said many times, I respect a lot of uh, what I've heard from, from Dayspring. Just like everybody else, I don't agree with everything he says. And so here's the thing. I wonder if there was a misunderstanding or if he miscommunicated or if uh, it wasn't exactly, maybe he didn't mean what the way it came out. Rick Folia, good morning from uh, Atlanta. And Bart Robinson, greetings. So as we said, telemedicine is going to be our long topic. Our short topic has to do with colon cancer. You know, it's an interesting thing about colon cancer. We say it all the time, and uh, it's true. There are tens of thousands of deaths associated with colon cancer. Now, the assumption is if we can get to them earlier and find them, we will save lives. Uh, Jesus will cover a short topic on this today that came out in the New England Journal that throws a little bit of question about, okay, exactly how, um, how effective is that screening? So uh, if you're new to our channel, here's the thing. We're all about helping people understand and prevent the major causes of death and disability. Uh, so believe it or not, there are very few major causes. Uh, carb metabolism problems are the biggest ones, and they come in several several ranges, ranging from mild prediabetes, insulin resistance, up to significant uh, diabetes. And we have all levels of that with our patients. Unfortunately, it's been shown that the evidence is very clear that uh, two-thirds uh, to three-quarters of docs, primary care, at least in the U.S., which is supposed to have the best healthcare manpower in the world in this space, three quarters of the docs don't know how to diagnose it, let alone treat it. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that's very important in medicine that you just got to learn on your own. Um, empagliflozin and kidney disease is one of our recent uh, topics. Why? What has that got to do with it? That deals with this number one cause, uh, diabetes, prediabetes. Uh, a new lean mass hyperresponder study, which we covered a couple of days, ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago. What's that got to do with this topic? Well, it turns out that people, when people go on low carb diets, some people, depending on their genetics, actually begin to drive their uh, their energy metabolism 
through LDL transport. And what happens in, is instead of their LDL, quote, bad cholesterol, which is not bad, um, that LDL shoot, instead of coming down, goes way up. And the question is, is that really unhealthy, like the vast majority of the population uh, of doctors thinks? If you go back and if you look at my life, every month or two, I get a call. It's a panic. It's from someone who has gone low carb. Their uh, LDL shot way up. They panicked. Their doctor panicked, wanted to put them on 40 or 80 of uh, Lipitor or 40 of Crestor. And it's like, whoa, slow down. That's not necessary. So, again, there's just time after time where. Uh, this stuff comes up, especially as we get past age 40. So that's what we're all about. Uh, men I mentioned uh, the, the uh, courses a few minutes ago. We've got four core courses. One is insulin resistance, which we've already mentioned. One is cardiovascular inflammation, where we actually show photomicrographs of the immune system attacking plaque in people's arteries. Um, a third core item that uh, docs just don't know that much about is how to evaluate plaque. You know, the go-to is, well, let's just, first of all, let's start with a Framingham um, evaluation. And the Framingham is almost always done in your head, in the doctor's head and wrong. Um, but even if you did it right, Framingham is wrong. It's the data that it's built on is uh, usually too old for example, it doubles the risk estimates, especially for women. Um, then after starting with Framingham, the next step is usually, okay, well, let's get a stress test. And stress tests only are positive if you have 50% or more occlusion. Two thirds of heart attacks occur in people that have less than 50% occlusion. So it's a flow study. It's, it's looking at whether or not you have flow and flow of blood is not a great predictor of heart attacks. That's exactly what happened with Tim Russert. He had a, a perfect uh, um, stress test, did well because he was a runner, but he still had that inflammation, that acne looking uh, pustules dropping, uh, dropping pus into his arteries and forming a clot and killed him. So there's a far better, and the worst thing after that, um, after the, the incorrect Framingham, after the, the uh, incorrect stress test, then the next place is to take you to the cath lab. And all of those are just like an evil, um, an evil triumph for it. There are better ways to evaluate plaque. And we talk about that in the course. If you have concerns about how to, um, how to get these courses, just call us. Um, Rafi, if you'll show the phone number or the email, we can we can help you get that information. It's life saving. If you're speaking of life saving information, we have several different outlets for it. Uh, obviously, YouTube is our home channel, but we have information on um, Facebook. We're co-presenting on Facebook uh, today and each Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> We also have uh, locals and Rumble if you're if that's your your uh, media of choice. Our uh, book I, we should probably go in and edit that. It's not a new book now; it's a couple of years old. Uh, but it's all about this whole discussion that we just had about how to evaluate plaque and uh, the fact that stress test is not the greatest place to start. Um, the pilot is going well, as, as Jesus will tell you, we uh, keep going over and hammering over and over and over some of the bureau bureaucratic issues associated with, uh, with the Medicare startup. But we're getting closer and closer, and we do expect to be able to start stay, uh, scaling up uh, our intake over the next few weeks. Any comments about that, Jesus, before we move on? Well, Whenever you get access to care that's going to be reimbursed by the government, there is an extra layer of complexity on that. But I think the benefits are going to be really, really big. And there's a lot of people just waiting for us. And we have a really impressive waiting list for that service. 
We are working nonstop on getting that ready. We have a couple of patients already on that pilot. And that's something that you don't want to miss. If you're a straight Medicare beneficiary, uh, that's the that's something that you want to go ahead and just get on the waiting list. You can do that on their website. Uh, if, as somebody said last week, if you had Medicare disadvantage, <laughs> we're not ready yet to take <laughs> Medicare advantage. Uh, we hope to be ready soon in the future and also other insurances, but we're one, one step at a time. And uh, although he was tongue in cheek with the term Medicare disadvantage, I will tell you if, uh, if done right, Medicare, it, I have gone, uh, if done right, Medicare advantage has huge advantages. Um, and for, for the patient as well as the doctor. And um, I'm personally on Medicare advantage now. I went straight traditional Medicare for one year and then uh, went into Medicare Advantage. Uh, if you're tired of waiting on us or you just can't get there with the telemedicine component yet and you still want to do it with your local doc, you've asked us, can we help your local doc? We sure can. And this is the way to do it. Uh, go in and uh, refer your doc to, to this area. I, we have trained Gosh, many dozens, maybe hundreds of docs now in terms of how to function well in the Medicare environment. So um, you asked for it, we provided it. There's a whole uh, YouTube channel and uh, website which will help your doc get where he or she needs to be. So Jesus, tell us about the uh, New England Journal article last year about um, colonoscopy. Yeah, so there's there's no question about colonoscopy saving lives. That's for sure. And that is something that is written in stone. However, the real impact, the cold numbers are yet to be, to be specific or be clear. So what they did on this New England Journal article last year in Norway, they wanted to see the specific impact of colonoscopy screening on colorectal cancer and death. So they follow a really, really big population, almost 100,000 people. Uh, ages 55 to 64, and they get invited. They got invited to get a colonoscopy, and they compared that group that got invited to get that colonoscopy to others who had the colonoscopy just as usual when whenever their primary care send them or they have an interest in getting one, and they wanted to compare if there was really a risk of cancer or related death for those folks who didn't get invited to get that colonoscopy. Um, so 42% of the invited group and 50, uh, almost 50,000 or around 50,000 of the usual care group are the ones who received a uh, colonoscopy. If you can, and if you, we can jump to the next slide so we can show you the results of this. This, this is an impressive study because they, they didn't only invite people, they invited them and followed them for over 10 years. And after 10 years, they did discover 20, uh, 259 cases on the invited group versus 600 cases on the usual care group. So when, when meaning that they, when, when they're looking specifically to get that screening of colon cancer, the results were uh, even less uh, common than folks that get the usual care. And you can see that on the risk of colorectal cancer, the invited group had a almost 1% versus 1.2% on the usual group. And the risk of death of cancer on the invited group was 0.28% versus 0.31%. So there's not so much of, of a difference. Uh, they stated that if they wanted to prevent colon cancer, they had to screen almost 500 people to get to one case. And it was lower on the participant invited to undergo colonoscopy screening, meaning that those and, and, and the interpretation can be really complex because if if we just take those numbers, you may say, well, this means that you should not get a colonoscopy and you're not get, because you're not going to get a benefit of it. And I think it's the it's actually the opposite. Uh, people who are often getting their usual care from their primary physicians are getting some uh, benefits of getting that colonoscopy done. Uh, just just for you to know, uh, colon, uh, colon cancer, it's as usual uh, to be present on one of every 25 persons, 23 men, 26 women. So one on every 25, uh, 25 
persons, it's just a too, too high rate of colon cancer. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think, Doc? I, I think, so I think the third, third, I'm sorry? I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So this is basically not saying that that colonoscopy is challenged in terms of, uh, of it working for a screening process. It sounds like it's saying a little bit more about how we get people in for a colonoscopy. Is that invitation working? Is that what it's saying? Yes. And if, if, you, if you see the standard guidelines, they included people from 55 years to 62, 63 years. And the guideline says that you should get your first one at around 45 years old. Um, and, and I think it's it's basically that. Sometimes the invitation comes from a primary care physician or just because it's popular knowledge that you should get one at a certain age. And it yeah. seems to me that that's enough. Uh, you don't have to be getting people to enroll into that, uh, like trying to search for people to get a colonoscopy. So one thing, so I will say that uh, when you start looking at the epidemiology of, co of colon screening and colonoscopy, it's always really the issue of not so much the colonoscopy itself. Once you get in there and get it done, that's, uh, that's very effective. And so don't misunderstand any of the stuff that we're talking about here. It's always the question of how can we effectively get people in to get that done? Because colonoscopy is not fun. People put it off. Um, I, I've had a couple of them and <clears throat> they're not fun. Um, there's another, you brought up another issue that I want to make sure and cover. I had a patient, um, 49 years old, uh, set up, uh, headed into her 50th birthday in a few months, uh, woke up, uh, had some GI symptoms, went to the bathroom and had evacuated a lot of blood. Turns out uh, that patient has, had had a, um, had a cancer. Uh, we, I have a business associate that, um, again, also before age 50, had diagnosed with a colon cancer. And the... Um, the standards changed, gosh, three, maybe four years ago. We, I covered that. Um, but, you know, it's like it gets buried in a thousand videos and people are just not getting the message. We were hoping that the message would get out there about getting colon cancer screening prior to age 50, especially if there's a family history. Uh, but again, time and time again, we're seeing that. We thought it would get out there with... Um, Bozeman, the, the actor, uh, he was the star of the original Black Panther movie. Do um, you remember his name? No, I know, I know exactly who you're talking about, but I don't remember the name. Um, it looks like maybe you're going to search for it real quick. Um, he yeah. died. He died from it. And so, again, don't let your... If you're old enough to have kids or if you have... Uh, relatives age 45 to 50, um, make sure that they know about this. This is killing, killing people inappropriately, unnecessarily in, in our society right now. And there's the technology to get, to get around it. And, and as the other thing, as we're talking about this, there are more people in the, in the ages 50 and above that are dying as well, simply because they are putting off getting their colon cancer screening. Now, there are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I'd rather do one of the other methods. You know, <clears throat> I'm less concerned about which method. I did a series a couple of years ago uh, of about, gosh, what was it? Half a dozen videos where we talked about all of the different methods of colon cancer screening. Bottom line is just get it done. Yeah. Any Ch Ch Chadwick Boseman. Yeah, Chadwick Boseman died uh, colon cancer prior to age fifty. And and the other thing, if 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 you get blood in your stool, unfortunately, it's probably too late. Yes, because it it it, it usually starts with hidden blood on the stool. Right. And and this is something that 
uh, I, I used to prescribe to patients who are at risk or who started with gastrointestinal symptoms at age 40, 40, 45, 50. Before the colonoscopy, I usually recommend to look for blood in the stools, and that provides some insight. Of course, that doesn't replace a colonoscopy. But yeah. when you find blood on the stool, that, that's, a, that's a red flag. Okay. So, so much for colon cancer and uh, uh, screening early and preventing death from it. Now let's talk a little bit about telemedicine. And I think uh, Jesus was being a little, uh, showing a little humor there in terms of saying, okay, let's get a second opinion on that. If you'll give us the water ball, Rafi, we'll go into that. So here's the thing, you know what, where did the, where did the slides go? There we go. There you go. Okay. So before COVID-19, Medicare primarily covered telehealth services for be beneficiaries really only living in rural areas. In 2020, like I said before, I had been struggling trying to get uh, populations to adopt telemedicine because of the huge improvement in access. And medicine's all about, yes, there, you need to touch a patient, you need to be able to do procedures, but the vast majority of it is really helping folks understand what's going on. It's a teaching profession. You know, it's interesting, when I was uh, running MD Live, uh, I'm still a, a, a senior exec with MD Live, but, when I, when I was running the basic operations for the organization, we set up a couple of telemedicine programs for uh, doctors in orthopedics and neurosurgery. Now, yes, I said telemedicine for orthopedics and neurosurgery. And no, this was not uh, robotic uh, remote surgery. This was pre-surgery and post-surgery. There's a ton of stuff that you have to do in terms of meeting with the doc, letting the doc know what's going on uh, that happens before and after the procedures. And so with some of these referral areas, uh, we, we were working with neurosurgeons and orthopedists who were who had routinely had patients uh, coming in from three, four, six, eight hours away. Well, you don't have to drive in eight hours just for that one month follow up or the two month follow up. Uh, telemedicine is a big, big deal, even for the surgical specialties. But again, trying to wrap the typical person's head around the fact that uh, it's information took a while until COVID-19. So when COVID-19 happened and the shutdown happened, uh, you look at companies like uh, uh, physician partners that I've done a lot of work with. And they said they went almost, they pivoted and went almost entirely remote during that shutdown. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued waivers to expand the type of telehealth services that would be reimbursed at parity, which is an insurance term. It's, it'll be reimbursed uh, at the same as in-person care. Uh, that's been going on for a couple of years now. They also waived licensure requirements and allowed providers to use technology platforms for help, for telehealth, despite not being compliant with HIPAA. Now, a um, couple of points. Uh, HIPAA compliance has improved dramatically in that space. Uh, it's not that difficult anymore to find a, a HIPAA compliant um, platform. But the bigger issue is the licensure requirements. They are still waiving licensure requirements. And basically what, the, what that means is this. Prior to um, the shutdown, you had, uh, you had to be, you, the doctor had to be licensed in the state where the patient was at the time of the interaction. So sometimes you would get a patient that lived in South Carolina, but they were visiting Minnesota at, if they saw the doctor at the time they were in Minnesota, the doc had to be licensed in Minnesota, not South Carolina. So <clears throat> that gets a little bit confusing. Uh, 
fortunately, I was able to deal with that in a slightly different way. I'm licensed in all 50 states and uh, and am current in my licensure there. So if you if you decide to do some work with us, we don't have to worry about that piece. There are very few docs, but there are a few. Um, and I work with a lot of them that are licensed in all 50 states. Now, what was the impact? In 2020, <clears throat> Medicare claims rose from 1% to 32%. 40. Now, wait a minute. Are you talking about uh, telemedicine claims for Medicare? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. 44% of enrolled Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries had telehealth visits. That's more than 45 million visits. Since the onset of COVID, CMS uh, allowed, yeah. allowed audio-only uh, services. Um, evidence suggests that services delivered through telehealth can be quality equivalent in, to in-person care. However, some stakeholders worry that individually paying for virtual visits using fee-for-service model made it, made it right? <laughs> made it. <laughs> <laughs> made it less likely. Oh, uh, <laughs> the, the yeah. technology would be cost effective. In other words, the, those stakeholders are saying, "Look, there's going to be so much of an increase of virtual visits that it's going to that any savings will will be overwhelmed." Is that what that's talking about? Yeah, and and this goes to the point of how uh, fee for value is better than fee for service, especially if you're using telemedicine technology even for the cost associated with getting that care. So yeah. fee for service value uh, gets really complex and way more expensive on telemedicine visits just because you have to afford uh, the physician. And uh, fee for value, it's quite different on how it's, val how it's uh, monitored and what indicators are and all of that. So. So I get that I get that concern that you listed there, but I have a story to um, that to me just says it all. And that that story was when we set up uh, the new program for um, for uh, primary care at uh, the new plant for Toyota in uh, San Antonio. It was a truck plant. I was there like half time for three years getting that ready. Um, <clears throat> and here's what happened. We invested uh, about seven million, seven and a half million in that new primary care program. We actually paid triple what you would, or tripled the number of primary care visits that you would expect looking at other similar type of uh, populations with similar types of insurance. Now, that sounds like a huge increase, right? And that's what these folks are concerned about. Oh, if we make, if we authorize te uh, telemedicine, you're going to get a huge increase on it, and it's going to do away with the uh, with the savings. Think about it again, and think about the rest of the story that I'm telling you. Although we tripled the primary care visits, we paid for that seven and a half million in savings in less than six months. How did we do that? Because people were not going, flocking to the ER. We had huge decreases in emergency medicine visits. We had huge decreases in hospitalization. We had decreases in specialty care. And that's exactly what you want to happen. You wanna get better primary care for people so they know what's going on so they don't use healthcare inappropriately, spending their time going to the hospital, not taking uh, care of themselves, end up getting admitted to the hospital, not just overusing the ER and specialty care. So I am not at all worried about inflation of primary care services uh, due to uh, increased telemedicine visits. So the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, you know, those guys look to see, you know, their whole, them, those guys in the OIG are always looking to see where, where waste is happening. And I'm sure they're going to report that last concern that you, that you raised as waste because they're not going to be able to see the other side of this issue. The CBO has project, projected expansions in telehealth, but it raises a lot of questions. Uh, the BPC, is that the bipartisan uh, committee? 
it yep. proposes a, a science review, a literature review. Medicare fee for service uh, analysis is using uh, a date before and during the pandemic. Interviews with stakeholders, providers, payers, and others, and a national consumer survey. Uh, an expert digital health advisory group as well. What types of services should remain accessible via telehealth beyond the uh, PHE? Uh, PHE, what is that? Uh, it's behavioral services, I believe, yep. Uh, under what circumstances and how should reimbursement work? So again, I'm gonna go back to my original story. Anything and everything we can do to increase good primary care is going to be better for the patients you see that because you're getting fewer hospitalizations and it's going to be better for health care uh, costs, hospital, uh, fewer hospitalizations, fewer ER unnecessary ER visits and fewer unnecessary visits to specialists. So that's my position. I've been there. I've seen it and I'm not likely to change on that issue. The findings and conclusions, according to the Bipartisan Committee report, Congress should extend most of the telehealth flexibilities of Medicare beneficiaries for two years at the end of the PHE and evaluate. Researchers should evaluate hybrid models and effectiveness. Services should, you know, I hate to say this. Overall, I don't trust uh, government to get there um, and do the right thing, at least in the short term. I lean a little bit uh, libertarian. Uh, but here's the thing. I do trust that uh, there'll be debate about this. It'll, it's likely to become a political football. But at the end of the day, after the football matches are over, I do think that it's going to become clear that improved telemedicine access, improved education to patients, improved access to the doctor and his or her staff, is going to be better for the patients. It's going to be better for the payers. You know, that's exactly what happens with CCM. It's all uh, the chronic care management. It's one of the programs that we're developing. Uh, Jesus did a lot of great work in terms of developing the program itself. And that's what it's about. It's about improving access to, uh, to the doctor's office for patients and to patients from the doctor's offices. Uh, back to their findings and conclusions, services should remain accessible for anyone. It's even more cost effective than the fee for value models. Hmm, that's an interesting uh, tidbit in terms of their opinion. Behavioral health access has been permanently authorized beyond the PHE and primary care is still the part that's in question. And again, primary care is just as big of an issue in terms of uh, access as behavioral uh, health in my, in my view. And uh, I think both of those should be permanent access. If I, if I may, just a quick correction, PHE, PHI, uh, PHE, public health emergency, COVID. Uh, and okay. I'm okay. sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. And the other one is if, if, if when, I, when I was taught at med school, they said, okay, they said two things that sometimes even seem to be contradictory. One is physical exams are critical because on physical exams you can find some things that, are, that you cannot find any, any other way around. And there are some specific maneuvers that you have to do with the patient to get some information. That's for sure. The other one they said, um, whenever you, ask, you talk with a patient, the answer you're looking for, it's on the conversation that you have with that patient. The patient is going to tell you what he's suffering from. If you're gonna to get to a diagnosis, the patient is gonna tell you the diagnosis. You have you have to uh, listen carefully. And if if we are with the assumption that every medical evaluation needs to have a physical exam to be successful, that's where the where the issue is. And there's there's a, there's a space for a face to face interaction and a physical examination that's necessary in some contexts and <clears throat> in some interventions, such as even even on emergency medicine. There's, there is also a use for telemedicine. There are, there are people who are using telemedicine physicians on the ambulance services where the paramedics provide some benefits on providing the physical exam, but they have the access to the physicians to, to, do a fi to take a final decision. So telemedicine, is, it's, it's already here. COVID just make it quicker to get there 
and yeah. it's just the 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 last part that needs to be fixed is laws and regulations that usually take more years to come to a place what is what is something that makes sense for everyone you know, part of your comments bring up uh, a quote. Um, there was a, one of the heads of uh, medicine back in the formative years of Johns Hopkins was a doctor named William Osler, very, very famous. And one of his most famous quotes uh, happened when um, he was sitting in that oak paneled uh, uh, auditorium where they would do grand rounds. The junior doctor was uh, asking the patient questions, and uh, Osler was known for being a little bit impatient. He jumped up and he slammed his, uh, the story is, he jumped up, slammed his fist on the desk, and he said, will you just listen to the patient? He's telling you his diagnosis. And when I had I didn't hear that story until I went to Hopkins and I thought I I got a big smile because uh, in my earlier training at um, at Charity Hospital and and MedU of South Carolina, some other places, I had always felt like modern medicine is getting way too deep in terms of labs. Now, you wouldn't think that given the number of labs that we do in terms of our evaluations, but. I have always been concerned that uh, doctors don't know how to talk to patients these days. If, if you know what to listen for, you know the questions to ask, you start finding out a whole new set of what's going on. And so in reality, I would agree with Osler, and I think what that comes back to today's focus on telemedicine. One of the key reasons that telemedicine has not been used uh, as much as it has, or, or more than it has. Yes, it's an issue with the patients primarily, getting it through, you know, getting their head wrapped around it, but it's also the doctors and the doctors' challenged ability, inability to get a good history and inability to communicate the concerns to the patient. So anything else before we go into Q&A? No, no, I think we covered the main topic here. Okay. You're going to stay with us for the Q&A or you, have you got stuff you're going to be doing? Uh, no, I can, I can stay. I always have stuff to do, but okay, I, I can stay. Right. <laughs> so we, uh, hold on. Uh, if you'll give us the transition, we'll go into Q&A. So if you'll go down and take a look at items you think uh, for sure that we need to cover, I'll hit a couple of quick hellos. Ali Sufyan, uh, John Tocho. Good morning, John. And John always reminds us to hit that like button. Please do that. Uh, remind the AI that's watching us and watching you as an audience that this is helpful information. Uh, we get we get good feedback every, uh, every couple of weeks that uh, we help save somebody's life. Mimi Kink, good vibes. Thank you, Mimi. Harvey Ops, regarding colonoscopy, I had a full scope in January 21. Clear. Family history, aunt and uncles. Up to what age should I should or could a person get a colonoscopy without concerns for damage? Well, uh, you want to start with that, Jesus? Sure. Um, if I remember correctly, there is no age limit. And there are things to consider, of course, because it's an important procedure that sometimes will uh, un that will require sedation. And if if you go by age alone, not ev not everyone age the same way. You have people who might have a higher risk for any proce procedure at age 50 and folks who have 80, 90 years old and have a really low risk for any procedure it depends on how your body is at that moment. There are some, uh, there is some evidence that if you get one at age 75, 85, maybe the benefits are not so big just because if you already had screenings in the past, uh, the, the possibility that colon cancer is going to present and be the cause of death at age 
85, maybe less than usual, just because of the uh, life expectancy. But I can tell you, there's no age limit. It depends on how your body is to to tolerate the procedure. And I would agree with that. We have this same discussion about at what point do you age out uh, quite often with patients. And I've had the same conversation with patients that uh, Jesus just clarified. So if you look at the standards committees, the U.S. Preventive, Task, Preventive Services Task Force, for example, says 45 to 75. Then they'll say at age 75 uh, to age 85, 76 to 85, talk to your doctor. And that's what we'll usually say. Now, it's not just an issue of your colon being um, uh, at risk as you get older. I mean, that's the most common assumption. There's another issue here that people don't quite uh, wrap their head around, and that is the growth curve for these things. Um, they grow very, very slowly. And so the question is, at what point uh, are you aging out from a growth curve perspective? That's part of the issue where I emphasize to my patients, you know, yes, you're 80, but uh, I see you living a lot more than the, the, um, the predicted 10 more years. So have that conversation with your doc and think more about that than you think about, you know, is my is the tissue of my colon too um, too thin? Elizabeth Pan, good morning from Virginia. Uh, Dennis Williamson, good morning, Dennis. Lee Lu, oh one, good morning. Off topic. Those are sometimes the best. Would you share your thoughts on the following two hour OGTT with insulin response? Probably will because I love that topic. It's just grossly undercovered. You know, it's interesting. They still do OGTT, but uh, in most places, but most of the time it's a one hour and it's for pregnant women only. That, by the way, is a huge predictor of heart disease. When you uh, get later in your life, during your midlife years, but it's grossly underutilized. So here's Lulu's glucose 109. I guess that was starting. If a, a fasting glucose, if that's a fasting glucose of 109, already we know you've got, there are issues. Uh, optimum fasting glucose is 80, 80 to 90. 90 and, and 90 up to 120 is prediabetes and 120 and above is full-blown diabetes for a fasting glucose. I've seen several fasting glucose values of 180 and 190. So it gets up there. And those people clearly had very significant diabetes. Uh, insulin of only two, I don't get that with a comment there. The one hour glucose was 205. Anytime, whether you're in a, uh, a challenge phase or otherwise, anytime you go over 200, you meet the criteria for full-blown diabetes. Uh, I think the the next phrase is insulin of 47. So what that's saying is uh, you should have a higher insulin value if you've got a glucose of 205. Uh, the optimum insulin values at one hour would be 50 or less, but that is in the context of maintaining a glucose, a peak glucose of 120 or less. You didn't meet that or this, these values don't imply that you met that. In fact, the glucose kept, kept going to 205. So number one, you've got insulin resistance. Number two, it's at the level of having full-blown diabetes. Number three, you still have some insulin. Your pancreas is making insulin responding, but it is not responding as well as it should be. You know, if, you're, if your glucose is going that high, you should be cranking up your insulin values. Now, the I'll skip over and make the comment that once people uh, get the pressure off of their pancreas uh, and, and their insulin receptors, they go low carb, they quit pushing this process. You do give your insulin receptors a rest. You do give your pancreas a rest and you can get improvement of that pancreatic function. You also have to lose the body fat, though, change your body composition, all of these things to to give that this ailing system a rest. And there's no question 
the system. I don't understand all of the numbers and exactly what how you've got them written down, but I do understand exact enough to know that this is clearly an ailing system, uh, ailing carb metabolism system, uh, and to the extent that it meets full blown uh, diabetes. Uh, glucose over 200, whether it's the one hour peak or two hours delayed peak, still meets the criteria for full blown uh, diabetes. The two hour on this one had gotten down to 89. So uh, there is that. Um, and a lot of that's due to the fact that there is still some pancreatic function going on there. The insulin was 22. And again, I hope that helps. How about you, Jesus? What are your other thoughts this is a clear example of a case of diabetes that will go undiagnosed with fasting glucose alone ah very very good point if somebody says sees that oh your blood you have a you, i like the way you say it you have a touch of sugar but let's yeah. see you let's see you in one year and see how that goes yeah <laughs> Maybe with, your, not, with no. your gtt it's, yeah. it's 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 clear enough to see that you're gonna get hit that by that by that bus Yes, they're getting hit by the bus. Now, um, to qualify that even a little bit more, it could be a lot worse. I mean, it, it, we've seen them where the one hour goes up to three, four hundred. We've seen them where the fasting starts out at 190. That one would, to your point, Jesus, would probably have already been diagnosed. Exactly. But, you know, I, I have to tell you, the first patient that we saw in the Alabama project, uh, we, it was a teaching case. So we the the NP was seeing, saw him for an hour. Then uh, I saw him with, uh, with the doctor for an hour. And after about uh, 45 minutes, he said, look, you've talked with me about diabetes. Uh, uh, about, you've mentioned it at least four times. I don't have it. I saw five doctors a total of six or seven times last year. Nobody told me I had diabetes. But I took your tests. And so we'll see. His was one of those that came back at a fasting of 190. So even though he had fasting almost at 200 itself, he still had not had a diagnosis. It's, it's, it's mind boggling the, the cases of diabetes that are being missed out there, let alone the cases of prediabetes. Now, let me just go on and say one other mitigating thing here. At least this peak glucose of 205 Again, as we said, it's not 300 or 400. The other thing is the two hour. So a lot of people uh, don't have an effective uh, insulin response and they're still going at two hours and have maybe climbed even further to 250. That's not happening with this case. Uh, you've gotten down to a safe level an hour or two. So you're not likely to be one of these people who uh, you eat something in the morning and your blood sugar is staying over 200 for about 10 hours. Um, by the time it comes back down, you've eaten again. It looks like you're doing this thing. So again, you got diabetes, but it could be a lot worse. Anything else? Uh, no, I mean, the, the insulin response is, it's still kind of uh, signaling that if you see the insulin response alone might not provide like the complete picture. If you have the OGTT alone, it doesn't provide the whole picture. That's why you're going to want to get them both together. Absolutely. We pick up, you know, we used to do just OGTT alone, especially because the labs wouldn't, they didn't know what we were doing in terms of asking for the insulin response. And we do pick up another 10 to 15, maybe 20% of people with significant insulin uh, um, resistance by adding that insulin response. They'll come in, they'll have relatively good numbers on the glucose side, and then we'll find out it's taking them 150 level of insulin to maintain that glucose. So it all depends on what's going on with your glucose metabolism and where you are on this curve. Thank you so much, Lilu, for uh, providing that. that this is one of the discussions that I've been wanting to get in front of the public um, in terms of just what an OGTT with insulin response is and how it's so important to understand what's going on because it's really clear. Your doctor's not going to share that with you.
LPG 12338, $19 super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, and Rafi, if you'll show, thank you, my, thank you, Rafi, for showing folks how, how to do that. Would you be interested in doing a video on the positive effects of microvascular and heart health from donating blood? Great work as always. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to think about that. Number one, thank you again so much for the super chat. For those of you who, um, who are not familiar with it, you can provide that. It's basically giving us a donation. It, well, it helps us to, um, to get this life-saving information out to folks. And uh, usually I pay for the, uh, the compensation for our staff, which includes Rafi and Jesus and a whole bunch of other people that you're not seeing on the show. Um, through the, the charges for seeing patients. So A, come see us as a patient, or B, uh, as LPG's done, just give us a super chat if you want to help contribute to getting this information out uh, to others. Now, regarding um, that information on uh, microvascular health and donating blood, that helps clear, there's no question that it helps in terms of uh, some People. It used to be a common uh, recommendation for folks with, um, oh, what's what's the term I'm thinking of? I have a, I'm having a senior moment, Jesus. The um, high hemoglobin levels. Um, uh, polyglobulia. It, it, yeah, uh, polycythemia, polycythemia. Some of those. Yeah, yeah. some of those. Um, people, people who smoke too much get that usually as well. And there's a significant uh, genetic um, uh, component to a lot of polycythemia, as well as uh, increased um, iron uh, load. But um, other than that, not that familiar with it. LPG, I'd, be, I'd love to hear and see if you have some information about this for just uh, people that don't fit that category. Leo Acapulco, good morning, Leo. Uh, waiting for when you take other insurance besides Medicare. Thank you. We are waiting too. And again, I think once we get up and rolling with Medicare, that'll make it a lot easier to get the other pieces done. Alan Turner, which medical specialties lend themselves to telemedicine? Well, you know, I, <clears throat> we got two of them that were just the most obvious. The most obvious is behavioral health. And that has just gone gangbusters. I remember when uh, I was, uh, I was helping run uh uh, MD Live when we got started with behavioral health. And uh, that was a challenge for us, but it is huge. And it's a big deal for MD Live, K Health, the other uh, competitors in that space. Now, um, and as you saw today in our discussions, we were now just getting to the next specialty that's most important in that area primary care. And uh, as Jesus pointed out, the experts haven't quite wrapped their head around it from a, a legal perspective that primary care is so important in this space. The other thing I would say is we covered a couple of uh, other specialties. Who would have thought neurosurgery and orthopedics? And the other thing, people when people think about telemedicine, they, they think it's just the physician on the screen and the patient. But telemedicine goes broader than that. So if you go one face to face, yes, uh, those are the main ones. But even in hospitals, there's there's telemedicine involved when you get the expert opinion from somebody who's on the other side of the of the country to see a patient who is uh, in company of other health professionals, and that's telemedicine as well. So we've got some questions coming up about Lilu's OGTT. Where did you get it? I'm looking for one, preferably at LabCorp. And Lilu says she got it at Lilu, or he or she got it at LabCorp. Uh, we get most of ours through um, Quest. Quest. LabCorp and Quest are the two big U.S. Uh, providers. What portion of these do you think come out um, didn't get done quite right, Jesus? Oh, gosh, it, it's... And sometimes it's the insulin survey. I don't know if they just copy and paste the first value onto the second value and the third value. Sometimes even 20%. I don't know. Yeah. I, I haven't done the numbers, but it's 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 higher than it should. Oh, I tell you. 
So I was getting my own done uh, when I was uh, at doing running the Alabama project. And they've got a great lab tech. They've got a dedicated lab in that clinic. They've got a great lab tech. I was not paying attention. And um, I noticed that on my second glucose draw, she also had five short tubes and she filled all five of those short tubes. And I happened to notice and I said, what is that? And she said, that's the insulin. I said, wait a minute, you just drew all of the insulins at the one, the half hour. She said, yep. I said, that's not the way you're supposed to do it. And she said, that's why yeah. <laughs> she said, well, that makes, uh, that makes sense. She said, I thought I would do it with each of the glucose things, but just, I've never done that. So I called the lab, uh, Quest National Lab Helpline, and they were very emphatic. They said, no, this is the way to do it. So <laughs> we wow. went to, we tried to get into Quest and their, their lab helpers. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see, it is a challenge just because labs are not used to doing that anymore. So lab techs are not used to doing that anymore. So just be patient. They're going to get some of these wrong. We get better ones from lab quest. I mean, from quest uh, than we have from any of the other lab labs so far, but just be sure. And again, buyer beware, help, uh, help uh, focus your provider, your, uh, lab tech when she, he or she's drawing that blood. Any comments about that? That's a struggle, and sometimes it depends on who is taking the who's drawing the blood, and if they they are willing to hear an opinion or, or not. Yeah, quite often they're not. More comments about Medicare Senior Advantage and disadvantage. Uh, Lilo, do you have the LabCorp test number? I can't seem to find it on their site. Good luck. But again, once you get that number, um, make sure that you're in touch. You're watching the lab tech and make and making sure that he or she's doing the right thing. Grandpa, good morning from Tennessee. I'm 76. My resting heart's about 45. I don't exercise much. 6'1", 265. Just got a good stress test. Anything I should be concerned about? Well, hey, Seuss, I see you raising your eyebrows over there. <laughs> There's a lot to be concerned about that, right? I, I, I don't know. I don't know if they, they whenever you get a, st a stress test, they even get you the result right away if they see something alarming, or they will tell you next that the next step you need to do is to get into the cat lab, and the next step you will find is that you already signed the authorization to get a stent if they find something oh, yeah. in there. Um, I think the concern will be that you getting a stent to prevent a heart attack that is not preventing at all. And don't get me wrong, a stents might save lives when they're necessary, but if you get them after a stress test, it's very likely that you don't need it. You might need just to focus on the root cause of inflammation and plaque before getting to that, that stent, thinking that you already solved your problems and you're not gonna get a heart attack. So uh, remember that stress test won't get any abnormal information until the flow is obstructed at 50% or more, and two-thirds of heart attacks happen when you don't get that kind of obstruction on the blood flow. You get less than that, and stress tests can detect, cannot detect that. So I'll be concerned about that, getting to the cat lab, getting a stand that I, that, I, that, that, that you don't need. Uh, I'm trying to look up the name of this book. Do you remember who uh, the Kraft, Joseph Kraft, Insulin Survey, uh, do you remember the name of his book? I don't. I don't. No, no, no. Uh, it's like the diabetes epidemic and what to do, what to do about it, or something. Um. So, Grandpa, I would really recommend that you look up this the name this book by Joseph Kraft. And basically, what he's showing you is, by the time we're age sixty, between well. Three, two thirds to three quarters of us actually have insulin resistance, enough to cause plaque. By the time we're uh, 70, more like two thirds, uh, between 70 and 80, you may get to where uh, half of us have full blown diabetes. So the fact that you didn't list that 
Uh, well, the fact that you listed that you got a stress test tells me that you at least have enough concern about cardiovascular disease to go and go through a few hours worth of testing and sweating to get that test done. But the fact that you didn't mention having had an insulin survey or an OGTT tells me that you're, you know, and it's, it's exactly what we expect. You and your doctor are not aware of this issue. So I would ask you to either get the name, get that book, read it. Um, and, or, you know, do the easy way, just uh, call us at our number and we can help you get started on it. So thank you, grandpa, for a really good question. Lilu, codes 101000, gestational two hour GTT, and 146993, insulin three responses. We'll need to guide them to get both drawn at fasting. Oh, yeah, you really do need to guide your lab tech. Uh, you know, Jesus, one of the things I'm remembering is I know that James has been able to co host with me where he was able to look at questions. I don't know if you're able to see questions or not. Are you? I can see them, but I can't present them, I think. I yeah. think he was able to do that as well. Maybe we should uh, look at the software a little bit more to see. Uh, are there ones that you want me to go to uh, next? No, I think that's that's really good. And I just want to make a, a comment about the previous one because we do, we do have that issue with LabCorp. And uh, if, if you're paying out of pocket for getting that OGTT, that's how LabCorp presents that code for the OGTT. But as you see there, it says just gestational. <laughs> so I didn't even pick that up. Yeah, and 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 this what you mentioned. This is really <laughs> this this is really commonly used for pregnant women to uh to see if they have gestational diabetes. Right. Uh, and when you deal with insurance companies, if you order this for a man. If you want no, that to get paid by the insurance, the insurance is likely not paying for that because you're a man and it's <laughs> obvious that you don't need that test for them. I mean, and LabCorp does a one hour, uh, it does fasting and two hours OGTT and the insulin survey that they have is four draw of four, four draws, like fasting one hour, two hour, three hours. And what we are sometimes doing and sometimes they get that sometimes they don't we add an extra glucose test after one hour so we get that ogtt for men that ogtt plus the one hour blood glucose and try to explain that on the order for LabCorp. quest is more simple they do understand what we want to do LabCorp is sometimes just dealing with that that kind of details because they don't have their the specific option that we're looking for so, for example, Rick Foley is saying, Lulu, thanks. Rick, if you use that uh, 101000, as Jesus mentioned, you'll get a hard reject just coming out of the blocks because they're going to know that you're not pregnant. Good pickup, Jesus. Thank you very much. Broken forever. Would an echo or chest CT with contrast show plaque? Quite often packed plaque is picked up on these other types of things. They're often picked up on a, on a dental x-ray. Um, but they're, you know, the standard is to do a, a calcium score, which is a CT that actually uses a timer, uh, which uh, correlates with the heartbeat to show calcium in the arteries of the heart. Alan Turner, what's recommended to improve function of inner lining of veins and arteries to prevent damage from small particle LDL, diet, supplements, vitamins? Well, that's what we do all day, uh, uh, all day every day. Hey, Sus, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. Um, so let's if go step by step, I will add two components there that are not mentioned, right? So first is diet, and we usually recommend low-carb diet eating no more than 100 grams per day. And you can call it whatever you want. You can call it paleo. You can call it keto. You can call it just low carb. Just it's it's not that we're saying that you should take a lot, a lot amount, lots amounts of fat, lots of amounts of protein, because even if you have kidneys, it's some, this, that's something to look, at for, look for. But just decreasing the amount of carbs that you're eating on a daily basis helps. Time-restricted eating helps. 
Intermittent fasting helps, especially if you're overweight or obese. If you have a few pounds of fat on your belly, getting those down, that's critical just because that's not that fat is providing a lot of hormones and intervening in metabolic processes that increase insulin resistance. Supplements, uh, there are a bunch of them. Uh, we usually, when we do know that somebody already has plaque, we do recommend uh, niacin, uh, something that can increase HDL, decrease triglycerides. Uh, we focus more on HDL and trig uh, triglycerides over, over HDL radio rather than on LDL alone. Um, there are others such as if you think about berberine as an alternative to metformin, which increases some of the insulin sensitivity. Vitamin K2 is a really popular one, and we have covered in the past because people think that vitamin K2, it's going to take out calcium from the arteries. And it's not specifically that. There's, there's a couple of articles that say that vitamin K2 has more effects of insulin resistance, and that's how it helps to not produce plaque. Um, vitamin D helps a lot, especially if you are low on vitamin D. Uh, you want to keep that below 100 and more than 50 to 70. And I will add medications. So if you already have plaque, statins are a big, uh, are a big deal. A lot of people do not want to take statin, especially if they are getting prescribed Lipitor 40 to 80 milligrams, and we don't use that. We usually recommend prosubastatin or pitabastatin, low doses, who have more targets on inflammation rather than just cholesterol with lower incidence of side effects. I will add exercise. Uh, especially high intensity interval training and sleep. Sleep is really, really important as well. And it's often very overlooked and people do not get enough sleep. And that also uh, increases blood pressure, insulin resistance. It's, it's the whole package. So there's no, there's no pill, there's no supplement, there's no vitamin that is going to do the work alone. I will tell you, you know, the two of the most important things in there are both lifestyle issues. Uh, actually, two of them are uh, really one item, and that's diet. Diet to the uh, extent to decrease your body fat. Body fat drives this process more than anything else. Uh, well, except aging, and we can't we can't uh, turn the clock back yet in time. So decrease that um, that body fat, but also on a day to day basis, as Jesus mentioned, uh, decreasing carbs. The other thing that's very important is high intensity intervals, like uh, Jesus mentioned. What they do is they reverse that downward spiral of loss of muscle microvasculature. In other words, uh, muscle access to um, uh, to capillaries. So. Very, very important items. Now, <clears throat> uh, there's an interesting comment about uh, Medicare and Medicare uh, Advantage. Jesus, uh, what's your perspective? He's just saying simple terms. What's the difference? Uh, Medicare Advantage has more services, like kind of deluxe services, like access to gyms and things like that. Uh, I do know that there in terms of how many money are you paying, straight Medicare usually has a 20% copay, which is which I believe is something that Medicare Advantage doesn't have. And there's kind of a 24-7 access to healthcare. And Medicare Advantage is, is also known as Medicare Part C. So it includes both Part E, which, which is hospitalization, plus Part B, which is patient with uh, with a physician or a specialist. And there's also vision, hearing, and dental care, I believe, on Medicare Advantage. I don't know if I'm missing anything else. So, yeah, a couple of different ways of looking at it. All three, maybe three different examples of simple uh, comparison. You may hear the term fee for value versus fee for service. Fee for service is traditional Medicare. In other words, you pay every time you get a service. Medicare pays every time you get a service and you usually pay a copay as or coinsurance as, uh, as Jesus mentioned. Um, another way of looking at it is uh, HMO versus um, 
a PPO type of environment. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. I'm in Medicare Advantage, but with a Medicare Advantage PPO. Uh, and I did that because I travel so much. If I had gone into an HMO, I would have been, would have been uh, more locked into local providers. And it's a very, very good thing that I didn't do that because of my travel. A uh, What was the third way that I was going to... Um, yeah, well, as Jesus mentioned, it has to do with uh, money. So with uh, traditional Medicare, it usually costs significantly more over the year. Uh, you get you, many um, Medicare Advantage programs, you have zero copay for uh, the vast majority of services. Uh, Medicare Advantage used to be seen as something that uh, uh, less wealthy um beneficiaries took. That's not so much the case anymore. Like I said, you know, I'm, I could clearly afford uh, traditional Medicare, but I prefer Medicare Advantage. Uh, hope that helps. Any other comments about that, Jesus? There are also differences on compliance on the side of the physician. Medicare Advantage is a little bit more strict on regards to reimbursement than the straight Medicare. It's not that such a big difference. But as, the, as a physician, uh, it's a little bit better to be involved in Medicare Advantage. So on a different topic, back to colonoscopy. Lilu says, well, how about the PrEP? D doesn't all of that, uh, you know, decreased uh, solid foods, all of that liquid, doesn't that just blow out all of the gut microbiome? I, I haven't seen that in the past. And even if that's true... Mm -hmm. Even if, even if that's true, I don't think it's like something important to be worried about because it's just a couple of days before the procedure and it's a, those are safety nets so the procedure doesn't have any complications. And I would say this, uh, there are things that will very adversely affect it. Uh, antibiotics, anytime you take a course of antibiotics and people don't think about it because they just take a little pill but antibiotics wreck our gut microbiome. Um, <clears throat> so be careful. Think first, second, third, fourth time before you ask your doc for an antibiotic for a cough, cold, congestion, things like that. That just happens all the time. Unfortunately, there are too, still too many antibiotics being added to uh, animal feed, which again is creating a major challenge for us in terms of antibiotic stewardship. But um, uh, colonoscopy prep, no, nope, not a concern. Another comment about colonoscopy. One aunt, this is from Harvey Ops. One aunt and two uncles died in a miserable way, too young from colon cancer. Get screened for everything. Colon, prostate, breast, CIMT, prevention and intervention. Improve your lifestyle. Thank you so much, Harvey. Any uh, comments, Dr. Vega? I will say that that's the whole truth, especially if you have a uh, uh, hist family history of that. As you mentioned, genetics loads the gun and with a bad lifestyle, you just pull the trigger. And sometimes the trigger gets pulled at age 40, 50, 60, just too early. There's something that has gone on. We did, just did not have as many uh, uh, colon cancers prior to age 50 as it started happening. Something has happened in our environment and we don't know what it is. It's not genetic, it's environmental. That change in onset, uh, change in age of onset. JMK, at age 74 with coronary artery disease, I'm overdue for my next colonoscopy. So again, another question about colonoscopy. I'm very concerned about prep, dehydration, no sleep, electrolyte losses, stopping my cardiovascular and diabetes meds. I get it. And uh, I will go back to Jesus's coverage of that uh, colonoscopy and invitation. This is exactly why the in, it's not the colonoscopy that's in question. It's getting that invitation, making that invitation effective and um, getting people through that process. As we said, growing old's not for sissies. And one of the, those things is, you know, going through a colonoscopy. 
Lulu, public health emergency. Thank you, Thank Lulu. You. Um, if they're getting mega doses of, of, of hello, Bobby, by the way, Bobby's in, uh, I think a healthcare provider in uh, the Philippines. The Philippines. Uh, if they're given mega dose of K2 in Japan, 42,000 micrograms for osteoporosis, is it safe for other chronic diseases? Yes. In fact, what I've recommended many times, Bobby, is, you know, people just quit worrying about these hundred microgram doses, you know, pills, which is what you normally see for K2. The mega dose that you get on uh, in the U.S., you can get it on Amazon, uh, 45 milligrams. And uh, yes, it's very safe. It's not like vitamin D3. You're not going to, uh, there's not a concern about overdose. Okay, if prolonged fasting increases HDL and reduces triglycerides, but also increases LDL, does it mean the LDL increases when repairing problems in your body, like the fireman, to remove inflammation? So, Jesus, any comments about the fireman versus the arsonist? Well, I think we are leaning more to this interpretation of what's going on. And uh, I, I I will say it's not often that you see that a LDL, the LDL is rising on intermittent fasting. That's not usually the case. There are some folks, as we talked about lean mass hyper responders, who are on low-carb diets and get an increase on LDL. And that's not as usual as seen as, as you might think. I don't think it's a rule that if you go into low carb diet, you're gonna see an increase on LDL. But if you do, I don't think you should be worried about it because as we said, we're leaning more that to, to think that LDL is a fireman rather than an arsonist. So uh, Bobby Ocampo says, and Boz, uh, Dr. Boz is saying that high range of vitamin D and you don't need in endoscopy and colonoscopy. Hmm, I am worried about that. I mean, I understand a little bit about where she's coming from. There have clearly been associations with appropriate vitamin D3 levels uh, and prevention of colon cancer, but I would not at all say, okay, my vitamin D3 is 75 today, so therefore I don't need an endoscopy. These things take years, 10 years to often to, uh, to grow. And so even if your vitamin D3 is good now, was it good 10 years ago when that cancer started? And did that, is that vitamin D3 going to eradicate cancers that have already gotten started? And that's mm. a big assumption that colon cancer is solely based on vitamin D levels. There are other risk factors involved. Yeah. So Lilu's going back and reinterpreting some of that OGTT. If the, it seems the person is insulin sensitive. Glucose peaks at one hour, then comes down to below the fasting level by two hours, while the insulin also peaks at one hour and comes down to two hours. There is no question, Lilu, that this person is responding to that insulin. The problem is, are they responding adequately for good health? And the answer is no. So thank you, Lilu. Great question. Appreciate you uh, giving us that opportunity to mention that part. If I can yes. mention, just, just adding a good insulin response will, will, you will see a good insulin response with those numbers and the numbers of the insulin are, are important. And those are not bad numbers at all. But it's what we said. If you just look at the insulin levels without looking at the glucose, the interpretation might be incomplete. Uh, a good insulin response will mean that you won't get over 200 at one hour. Very, very good point. The, uh, we got a couple of questions and comments about this specific uh, issue or, or the uh, further about the OGTT. So Elizabeth Pan is saying, does reversing diabetes mean I can eat carbs without adverse effect? Or does it mean that I have to limit my carbs in order for my blood sugar and insulin to be acceptable? Um, you, you have covered this. Who is this? Who's this, this doc, uh, Jason Funk? Yeah. Is Jason Funk to... likes to say you can cure your diabetes. And uh, it, it's, it's a big quote on cure because of course, if you, if you're doing the, the right thing and taking care of your lifestyle, of course, you are not going to be worried about diabetes anymore if you do the right thing. But as soon as you stop doing that, uh, it's likely to come back and haunt you uh on your sleep on even if you're awake right and uh 
I I do know that of, of one specific scenario when evidence has showed to almost be done with diabetes, and those are people who get into bariatric surgery, who are really, really overweight and get that surgery and their blood glucose glucose levels just come down. But even there, even in those cases, if they you gain those extra pounds again, you're very likely to be keep dealing with this. So I, I won't say that you are uh, curing it rather than reversing it means if you keep it controlled with your lifestyle, uh, it's it's I, I think it are a really more um, comprehensive and r- rational goal to get is not needing medications. Yeah, I think that point. that that's a that's a more uh, a more realistic goal to uh, reverse your diabetes without using medication. That's really highly doable. But so if you do the lifestyle component. Yeah. So if I've seen it once, I've seen it hundreds of times with our patients where folks come in, they have clear cardiovascular uh, plaque. But and then we do an OGTT and it looks good. And then the, the response was, well, doc, I lost 50 pounds over the past two years. Oh, well, that's what happened when they had that extra 50 pounds of body fat. They were not able to to uh, metabolize carbs effectively. They lost the 50 pounds. Now they're able to do that. Those people effectively have a cure. But as Jesus said, only as long as they keep that 50 pounds off. As soon as they gain that weight back, they're in the same space. So uh, the other way of looking at it is saying, again, uh, you can take the risk off the table, but only so long as you're managing the risk factors. And again, as Jesus said, we've, we've, gotten plenty of people off of diabetic medications as well by doing exactly that. Now, another really interesting point about this, Lilu, the above OGTT person is 6'1", weighs probably between 125 and 130. So they've got a, a BMI, gosh, probably 18 or less, very, very thin. Uh, athletic, healthy diet, not high in carbs. So very strange. That's not strange at all. The point is, it's not just body fat. Some people think that body fat is everything and body fat drives this. Age is more important than body fat. And genetics, we're leaving genetics out here too. You know, at a BMI of 21, uh, that was when I first diagnosed my own diabetes. And that was what, late 50s. So this is, you got, uh, again, age and genetics are very, very important in this area. Other uh, comments? She, she, uh, the Lilo is asking if the uh, DM2 is insulin resistance, why is the fasting insulin only of two? And this is what you tend to see with insulin response. Um, as you are developing these high levels of glucose on a regular basis, your insulin levels might, might tend to either increase or stay low. And that response, it gets affected by a lot of other hormones. Higher insulin response or higher levels of insulin doesn't indicate necessarily that there's a good response. And the two, three, four levels of insulin for one person might not be as effective as 10 or 20 from another person and vice versa. So that's why you want to see them both. If you see high levels of glucose and you see low levels of insulin, uh, there's something happening with the response on the body is not uh, producing enough insulin at those levels. Very good. Again, that was a great discussion. I've wanted to put that on the uh, on the channel for a while. And you know what? Maybe, Jesus, we could do a couple of other um, sample uh, insulin surveys just to help walk people through the interpretation on that. Uh, I've got I've got to go. But uh, one last uh, comment before we do. Gregory Dixon, 
you repeatedly say that information, and he clarifies later, he means inflammation, causes soft plaque to erupt. What causes the soft plaque in the first place is my question. Thank you, Gregory. Dr. V? Uh, how, how, how to say this? It's, it's a continuous process. It's not like you have already had soft plaque and then you got an inflame and it got ruptured. You got soft plaque because you got inflammation in the, in the first place. Right. And the lining of the artery wall is going to get uh, smaller and smaller and more damage as years pass by with that inflammation until it breaks and puts all that soft plaque out and then comes the clot and then comes the heart attack. So you know, it's one culprit of everything, both producing soft plaque and rupturing. Jesus, uh, do, have you seen any of the images of the glycocalyx? Sure, we have. A, uh, we, we presented that in the past. Yes, we do have I, one. I'm thinking it might be helpful to do maybe just a short uh, on the glycocalyx and, you know, that image where we show uh, the photo, the electron photomicrograph of the glycocalyx and then the injured glycocalyx from having uh, elevated um, uh, glucose for too long, you know, above 140 for hour after hour. And so you you damage all of those hair follicles or the, the mucus-like consistency of that inner lining of the artery wall. And here's what happens at that point, Gregory. Once you get damage to that glycocalyx, small, dense LDL, then starts penetrating through that lining of the artery wall. That starts the soft plaque process. So um, we'll go over that a little bit later again. Good question, Gregory. And lots of good questions. As usual, there's no way we can get through all of them. Thank you so much for your interest. And if we didn't get to your question today, please uh, uh, get on early next week and get it in there earlier. Thank you again for your interest. Uh